Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDag, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDag is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDag, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. And that's what it feels like to be a Sunderland fan again. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Roker Report podcast where we've had a fairly abysmal week, I'm afraid to say. Sunderland have taken one point from the six in the past week and so our promotion push is now looking a lot more precarious. The lads drew 1-1 against a fairly resilient Burton side in a game that really could have gone either way. And then, as we all know, as we all, all have seen, they got beaten by Coventry by five goals to four in an absolutely ridiculous game that highlighted a whole load of problems and is just a game that um, has generally put me in a terrible mood with regards to football. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much that. But on a much brighter note, I am joined in the studio today, well, this one, it was a tricky one getting this guest in because when I was liaising Emma with the people over for the Brazil national team, it was difficult trying to get them to organise this this particular guest for the podcast. You know, I mean, Scolari is not an easy guy to deal with, but after much talking and much negotiating, I am proud to say we have Danny Collins in the studio. Hi, Good afternoon. Danny. Good, thank you. Yep. Good stuff, yeah. Good. I'm, I'm not too bad, you know, yep. a, a result aside, I suppose. Yeah. If, um, if, as a Sunderland fan, you know. Been worse. There's been much worse games in much worse contexts, but it is what it is. I'm also joined in the studio by Johnny Goldsmith here as always. How are you doing, Johnny? All right, Alex. Hi. Yeah. I enjoyed the game. Sat next to you yesterday. Yeah, sat there. Both All just right. sat sulking for about you know 80 or 90 minutes. So that's 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 <laughs> what it was. And also Chris Cam, he's here. So, Hello. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm all right. I'm just sort of bewildered, staggered. Yeah, I, just, I couldn't believe what was going on. I was there by myself yesterday, and I was sat next to a member of sort of the old guard, an older fella. Right. And um, I learned from the fans sitting around him that he had, he just recently had heart surgery, mm-hmm. so he was stood up like every ten minutes, shouting and raving. Yeah, 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 yeah. People around him going, "Sit down, man. Think about the stitches." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the worst possible yeah. game to go to after heart surgery. That you know, like it's just the football gods are being cruel there. Oh, he wasn't very happy. Like, no, 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 you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be. You know what, Chris? If you went there by yourself, I had a spare third ticket. You know, you could have sat with me and Johnny. Oh, well, what, you could have said that. I, I, didn't see that. <laughs> I, I inboxed you on WhatsApp and you, you just... Yeah, and, and I just went, oh, yeah, I've already got a ticket, thanks. Right, and then well, well. you didn't then go, oh, well, I've got an extra seat. Do you want to use your ticket up next to me? Yeah, but no, well, you just didn't, did you? Uh, so, well, it's probably my fault, mate. I'll, I'll... But to be fair, I wouldn't have had that charming anecdote about the old fella if I sat next to exactly, you. Exactly, yeah, exactly. You would have had just like me and Johnny sat there being sad, which is not nearly as interesting. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so uh, we all know what the games were about. So let's have our three-word review and see what the good people of Twitter thought of our week with the Coventry game, the one fresh in their minds, unfortunately. Ian says, practically, tactically inept. Tom Albrighton says, absolutely no composure. Jack Bramley says, where's Alim Ozturk? Yeah, yeah <laughs> and exactly, Jack. Where is he? Where is Alim Ozturk? Where is he? I feel like you Get can release out. a Black Eyed Peas style, where is the Alim Ozturk track Honestly. in the summer? Oh, I'm, I, that, I, I'm, I've always been banging, banging that drum. Where is Ozturk? As loud as it can possibly be now. Anyway, John Ollier says, wide open spaces. Hazy says, awesome flags display. I think one of, that might be the only positive one in here. Lewis Chappell says, Baldwin dropped permanently. Mark Carrick says, played without defenders. Peter Harwood says, very tactically naive. Timothy Walker says, centre-back hell. Gary Jerry says, where's our defence? Anthony Rand said, we can't defend. Adam Thieger says, rubbish tactics again. Dave B says, bottle, bottle, ouch. I like that one. <laughs> I feel like it makes no sense, like normally, but that just like for what has happened, that perfectly summarises it for me. Bottle, <laughs> bottle, ouch, spot on. And Adam Curry says, "Bring Aussie back, good old Aussie Oz Turk, get him back in the side." <laughs> needs that, needs that return. So yeah, very common theme in the three-word review. Uh, we are all absolutely sick as a parrot thinking about that defensive display. 
What did you make of it, Johnny? You were sat there next to me, so mm. I've already heard all your thoughts. But let's let's share them. Let's share them over the airwaves. What did yeah. you make of our defensive display, if you can call it that? Um, that was one of the worst I've ever seen from Sunderland defenders. Tom Flanagan, uh, who apparently I believe is meant to be a left back, but he's playing centre back anyway because he's a big lad and he's not that good at it. Um, Jack Baldwin, uh, I think he's a good defender. I think he just needs a better partner with him, potentially. He reminds me of Kone. Yeah, excellent defender. He just needs somebody next to him telling him where to stand. Needs a couple. Mm-hmm. Like he can read the game brilliantly as well. Like um, yeah. against Burton, the goal line clearance he had, he was already on the line before he even took the shot. Mm-hmm. But that's like a great anticipation. He's tackling. He's normally okay. We just have a couple of suspect ones. But then, if he just had somebody next to him, if if any one of that back four had a bit of responsibility and leadership and was telling everybody else organizing the defense, I think we'd been a, we'd be a much better team, much better position this season. I think Luke O'Nine's been pretty poor yesterday as well. I normally think um, he's done very well at right back, but I think yesterday, I don't know. It just it, everyone seemed very off. Every, every, everything bad about that team was exposed yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, if we didn't have John McLaughlin in goal, I fear it could have been much worse. Yeah, so. well, I mean, to be honest, there wasn't much McLaughlin could have done about many of those. I mean, it, when you're defending a midfielder getting cut up and down the middle like that, and you've got fast pacey wingers and strikers just running through one goal I don't know what you expect McLaughlin to do Yeah, I, I feel for him really because he's been a very good keeper this season and I think any five goal scoreline against him is going to look very harsh mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, I think at left back I think Oviedo best of bad bunch yesterday but I think he was probably the better defender out there we know how good he is obviously he's played at much higher level than all the other defenders that we have so we probably expect that from him um, probably yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would your response to be like, like during the game, Danny? Like, if you're sat there, you're three one down after half an hour. Yeah. What's your initial like response <clears throat> to the players around you? Um, well, obviously, you, you know, it's a big game at home. The position Sunderland are currently sat in, and you know, it's not ideal. Obviously, three one at home. Um, on the plus side, is you've still got a lot of time to get back mm. into the game. Um, a lot of young lads in the team try and get around and say, "Listen, just steady yourselves down." You know, it's a long, long way to go in the game. See if we can nick one back before half time. They actually got a couple back before half time. Yeah. Got it back to three three. So you get in there. Obviously, I've seen the goals. They, they were poor goals. To, mm-hmm. I know no goals are good goals to concede, but they were poor goals they gave away. Um, I just say you get in at half time. I said, listen, boys, we've got forty five minutes to get ourselves sorted out. Um, you know, we're in a good position now. Let's not let it go and, and let's kick on second half. And unfortunately, um, they haven't done it. No, and I was going to ask you as well, Danny. Um, you've said there you've you've seen <laughs> all five hits in yeah. all five of the goals we've conceded in that yeah. one game. Um, what what did you make of those? Were there any like real like cardinal sins as a defender that were made there? I mean, I think the obvious answer is yes. But w- what to you stuck out is if that was you playing, how would you have just approached that game differently? What would you have done that Baldwin, Flanagan, and Code didn't do? Mm. In general, looking at the goals, it looked open. Do you know what I mean? They turned the ball over and then there's a couple of goals where they're picking it up and they've got 30, 40 yards of space to run into, the Coventry boys. Um, I think the first one, I think O'Neill might have tried to thread one in, didn't he? Got cut out. Yeah. The lads put it in the bottom corner. Uh, again, a couple of the other ones, someone's tried to play one into, I think, meant Charlie Wyke. Um, the lads nicked in front of him. They've picked it up halfway line. They drove it to Sunderland and just seemed too open. Do you know what I mean? There's, you know, if, I think if I'm in there, you know, the score's 3 3 or whatever it was at the time. I think you're having a word with your centre midfielders, getting older Grant and, and one or two of the other boys. And Max Power wasn't in there yesterday. And just say, sit yourselves in, steady the game down, and let's just be organised and solid. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, it's not ideal at the situation they're in at the minute. They, what they drew 17 games already this season. So, you know, you're at home, you know, four or five games to go. You're looking to kick on and win and to try and, you know, cement one of the automatic spaces. But, um, you know, just situations are different in games. And I thought yesterday, just looking at the game, I mean, I've only seen the five-minute uh, highlights of the game, and it, yeah. you know, could have been. A, it's like a basketball match when you're watching it. Um, <laughs> exactly what it was. You know, yeah. so <laughs> I just think you've got to sort of steady it down. You know, if we have to take a point, we take a point. You know, it's not doom and gloom in, in a way, but you know, to concede five at home when you're looking at you know cementing a place second in the table, uh, it's not great. Yeah, I think it's one of those games where you'd probably looking back at it. If we're going to lose by a one-goal margin, I'd rather lose one-nil than five-four because at yeah. home to ship five in your own backyard is just like it's. It's not and ridiculous. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter where you are, especially when you're, you know, fighting for an automatic promotion yeah. spot. It's just not on. And you score four as well. Yeah, it's just it's it's, it's amazing. It's really is amazing. It's frustrating as well because I don't think Coventry were that good. You know what I mean? They weren't no. five goals good. Yeah, they were just we attacked well when we got forwards. You know, there was a couple of moves. I know. I mean, the assist that Morgan created for the first, like the, the equaliser, the first goal for us was fantastic. Oh, to drive yeah, that absolutely. far. The goals we scored 
as scrappy as they were, the build-up was all right. So the system was justified going forwards. But defensively, we're essentially playing with two wing-backs and they were both getting forward at the same time. Yeah. So you're left with Baldwin and Flanagan by themselves. And that just plays into Coventry's strengths because when they do turn the ball over, which we're going to because we're trying sort of more ambitious passes to break them down, they've just got absolute pace on the wings and that was what we couldn't deal with. Even when 9 was back, he's not quick enough to keep up with, uh, I think it was Jordi Huula who was giving him trouble. Yeah. So it's it was that was the, the biggest tactical thing. I know a lot of people were upset with Jack Ross after that game and the biggest reason has to be because you've you've set your team up in such a way that they're great, we can go and score four goals, but you've then played yourself into their hands mm-hmm. and they, they're fine. They know that they can score pretty much at will if you're playing that type of... Like every single goal for them was pretty much a... A move that started from a, a through ball in between the centre half and the full back, or the full back that wasn't even there because they were caught up the field. What's troubling is that you've played, as you say there, Chris. Uh, you said that you didn't think Coventry were that good. I agree. I don't think they were that good. What I do think they had was a, a system that played to having to getting the ball to their creative, pacey players, mm-hmm. and that was enough to open us up. On the counter, we looked totally exposed. Mm-hmm. To the system that we used would leave us when we went on the attack we couldn't get back in time by the time that Jordi Hawula back at Yorgo and Co were racing down the field there was only Baldwin and Flanagan who could feasibly catch them and as they've shown today they don't look like they're working very well together at the moment I'll say that as the kind of thing I can say right now they're, they're looking quite poor so if you've got three or four attacking players running at you and you're, they're pinging the ball left right and left right and centre they're going to cause you so many problems and if you if you're playing a team who's got either pace or quality to do that, as we've got in the running, then I can only fear that with that system you'd, you'd go you'd also concede a, a, a shipload. Yeah, of goals. if we play that way against Pompey, uh, oh, Jamal Lowe and Ronan Curtis are going to have a field day. Oh yeah, I mean, what about Doncaster? John Marquis, he'll he'll be lovely. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Obviously, like he's a bit more central, uh, Marcus, so he's, he's probably going to be a bit more like contained just by his position on the pitch. Mm-hmm. But uh, I feel I sort of I, say, I feel sorry for Ross in the sense that. Like normally, I like to sort of clap back of like, oh, well, you could do this, we could set it this way. I haven't got a clue. I would, I, I couldn't manage Sunderland because you just have no, How do you stop that? Like, if you haven't got the players who are quick enough and agile enough to stop fast wingers, then mm. what do you do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, for large parts of the season, I'll direct this question to you now, Danny. For yeah. large parts of the season, we've played a four-two-three-one yeah. system that obviously has a back four, and then you have two holding two midfielders shooters, yeah. who've mainly been Catamull and Ledbetter in the latter stages of the season. Yeah. And they've done a very good job of covering the, the centre backs. Mm-hmm. We've reverted to a four-four-two very recently, That's which it. has left us with a, a more shallow midfield, but with two up front. Yeah. We've been scoring more, mm-hmm. but then when teams have been coming at us, obviously as yeah. you've seen yesterday with the, with the second goal. Mm-hmm. The midfield, if that gets cut open, the defence then gets cut open, and it's, yeah. it's like getting a pair of scissors and just going down the middle of a piece of card. Yeah, yeah. With their, that's what that's what they were like yesterday, mm-hmm. going through the middle, Coventry. Yeah. Have you? I mean, I'd imagine you've played in many different systems in your career. You know, yeah. you've had a very you've had a very long career. Yeah. Do Do you find that a system like that, like a four two three one, is a lot more sort of comfortable for a centre back than yeah. say a four four two or a four three three is? Yeah, I mean, um, this season we've played a three five two. You know, back mm-hmm. yesterday we went back to a four four two. Um, I do think if you've got the sitter in front of the back four, it does help out. You know, if you play 4 3 3 with one of their sitters and two yeah. either side just in front of him. Sorry, where do you typically play when you play for Grimsby? Like, uh, If we play a back three, yeah. I play on the left of the three. Right. Um, back four, I left centre off. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that, that's my position. Do you tend to play on the on the deck, like keep it down? Like, Do you have a midfielder come short for it? or you um, it Yeah, lad, um, Jake Hessen Tyler just sits in front of us at the minute. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, he's comfy on the ball and that, so we do try and get out and play a bit to him if we can. We haven't really got a, an out-and-out target, man. You know, no. You find with a lot of teams in League 2, <clears throat> more often than not, teams have a big lump up top who, you mm-hmm. know, they try and drop it into and play off them. Yeah. We haven't really got one, so we haven't got that option as such, so we tr- we have to try and play, play a bit and, you know, and pop it through the lines and that, really. Um, but yeah, going back to your question, as you say there, if you've had Grant and, and Cat sat in front there or, or Max Power, um, gives you that bit of you know stability really. Mm-hmm. If you like, if you if you say your left back's pushing on, one of those guys can just slip across yeah. ten yards and cover the left back slot for them. Mm-hmm. Vice versa on the other side, if O'Neill's pushing on down that side, um, I think if you're saying if you've gone to a four four two, if the if the opposition are perhaps playing a four four one one, it's that that one in between. The other side of the midfield, and as a centre half, you don't really like to, you know to get dragged out that ten yards if he's just playing in that pocket in between the mm-hmm. centre halves and the and the centre midfielders really. Um, so it causes problems, and that it's stuff you you do tend to work on during the week. I'm sure Jack Ross has had had a look at you know Coventry or wherever you're going to be playing. You know Thursday, Friday, you'll do work in the 
in the in the media room and you'll watch the opposition and you know, point out their strengths and weaknesses. Um, yeah. You know, teams will do that with Sunderland as well. Do you know what I mean? And they'll mm-hmm. see. You probably watch watch the game yesterday, and they'll think, "How can we hurt Sunderland now?" And and vice versa. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would want Doncaster to perhaps be setting up, thinking that we might go for a four four two. Although I'm not naive enough to believe that. Um, you know, we would absolutely <clears throat> stick with a, a formation yeah. that has obviously not been doing us well very recently. I don't know what you think, Johnny. I, I mean, for me, it's a no brainer. I think we should swap the four four two for perhaps something more tried and tested, like the four two three one, which has done us a lot better this season. What would you do? Um, how would you set the team up going into mm. the Doncaster game? Well, I guess you could try that um, system that's worked. Whatever's, whatever works, we should go for it. And I think maybe one of the centre-backs needs to be replaced uh, in the game as well. Maybe, I don't know, I know you really want to see a Liam play, and I really think at I this stage, you just think, like, it's, well, it can't get much worse. You might as well give something a go. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe taking out Flanagan and putting in Osterk with Baldwin, perhaps. Or done with Baldwin. I mean, that's worked in the past as well. Sometimes. Imagine saying that after the first two games of this season, like, "Oh, let's just give Osterk a try." That was like genuine fear went through my mind. But like, yeah. <laughs> you said that like at the start of the season. Well, I mean, mm. I mean, in pre-season, he was an absolute bomb scare. To be fair, like, <laughs> I think, I think he's one of these players. Like, I love having a player with the club that, like, um, that is just like the cult hero. It's like mm. the, you, you know, they're a bit of an enigma. You never know what's going to happen. You know, we had. We had Virginie, you know, I mean, we had Nyron. Nyron. Nyron, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could see you're about to say it there, yeah. <laughs> Nyron, a fantastic uh, player he was. Was he as good Sunderland. in the change room as he was, like, watching him, like, operate on the pitch? <laughs> like, uh, Nyron, he's quite a chilled, relaxed fella yeah. off the pitch, you know. Yeah, yeah. Jamaican roots and that, I think. I think he's just uh, <laughs> chilled and yeah. quite quiet. Uh, he like yeah. seemed like he would be, yeah. But, uh, I mean, t- honestly, right, if... if Looking back at yesterday, I think if we could have got you and Nyron on an emergency loan for that game yesterday, I would have been happy with that because <laughs> crikey, I think that could be Bolton and Flanagan's worst. I mean, that that must be categorically their worst performances of the season. It really didn't come off for them. But what do you think, Chris? How would you set up differently going in at Doncaster? Um, maybe stick Dunn back in the team just because we need somebody big to contend with, uh, mm-hmm. Marcus. Um, I'd leave Baldwin. I'd take Flanagan out. Yeah, I think Flanagan was maybe at fault for two off maybe even three of the goals mm-hmm. then ask Ledbetter and just tell him just sit do not even you don't even need to cross the halfway line like just sit in between these two collect the ball and then mm-hmm. get the, the the move going and that then gives Oviedo or um, O'Neill that licence to go forward with that chance of being caught on the break sort of uh, lessened and then through the middle up like we've talked through the middle obviously you got McGeady on one wing would be great Morgan I think I don't think he's done anything to deserve being dropped so no. he would start on the right. Wyke up top by himself, Greg sits, and then Honeyman. But Honeyman has to play that number 10 role properly because he was asked to play as a right midfielder in the 4-4-2 and I don't think it's his fault that he didn't do a great job because he's not a right midfielder. And it's not Ross's fault that he's had to play there because we've only got yeah. one winger. Um, but he wasn't playing as a right midfielder so it was, it was weird to watch. He wouldn't stick to the touchline and stretch the pitch. He would come inside but if you're going to come inside, then don't stand where he was standing, which is basically, you had their two centre-halves, you had Grigg on one, Wyke on the other, and then Honeyman just sort of stood next to the other one with Wyke. Yeah, he was quite... So, if you're going to stand there, then when Wyke wins the header, you've got to win the second ball, otherwise you just, you literally might as well not be on the pitch. Yeah, he was and, very positionally yeah. just like quite nice. And then when I we think... did have the ball, he would stand in absolute no-man's land between their full-back and centre-half on the right-hand side, instead of dropping into that central area as the number 10. Mm-hmm. So... He's sort of in the middle, not really doing anything. Like go, go out wide, stay out wide, or come in and occupy that space. And as Danny said earlier, it gives you a bit more to think about as a centre half when you've got that guy, sort of tempting pocket. you to step pocket, out. Yeah. Whereas he was pocket. stepping up to the centre half, so making it really easy for them. Yeah. One thing I will say as well, I, I do feel that yesterday something that really frustrated me was um, there was an opportunity for um, Coventry to get another goal. And Grant Lenbitter is the one heading the ball out. And I'm ah, thinking, far that really often. frustrates me. I'm like, a five foot eight centre midfielder is doing the defending rather than the six foot two yeah. centre half. Is he five eight, Lenbitter? Uh, well, I mean, I think he, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, he's he's not very big. From, from memory, Daddy, yeah, what would you say? It's similar, like, yeah, five eight, five nine, yeah, I don't know. Not, yeah. not particularly, I mean. But like, the, the, the point being, like, a centre, centre midfielder shouldn't be the one to head all the balls away, it should be the centre back. And it was kind yeah. of frustrating me. And if Lenbitter looked like he was playing a sweeper at one point, and I've never seen that before, but. It felt like he was doing that, you know, to me. It felt like, uh, I don't know. He can do, as, yeah. as long as we're playing that sort of 
not playing two up front system where he's sitting, mm-hmm. he can be a sweeper if he wants mm-hmm. to, but we shouldn't need him to because no, no, the no. centre half should be able to deal with it themselves. I think there's something to say there, Chris, about Honeyman needing to play the number ten role. I think there's definitely an element of needing the players to play in the positions they're assigned to. There's got to yeah. be a certain, obviously. I mean, there's, there's going to have to be fluidity in a team. You can't just make everyone. You know, if someone's playing a full back, they're not confined to maybe the, the you know the, the fifty yards of space on that flank. That there's going to be movement around. But as you say there, that's that's right. With with our defenders though, it's interesting because I've seen a lot of them. Uh, there's been a lot of like divide of opinion on like what we should change because I think something's got to change. You can't keep Bolden and Flanagan in after that absolute shocker of performance. But this is a question I think again for you, Danny. I've seen a few people say that we should swap out one of them. A few to say that we should, we should swap out two. Nice. How um, uh, detrimental can it be to a team? How <clears throat> is, is it is it too big of a change to just take out two centre backs and put two new ones in? Is that ever? Um, possibly. I mean, if you've if you've been shipping goals regularly, yeah. um, which I don't think you've been too bad. I think, no. but you've got fourth just, best just defensive record in the league. Well, yeah. third before yesterday, but yeah, fourth, well. you know, best defense. So they've been doing something right all season, mm-hmm. really. Um, then you've got, as you say, Dunn can perhaps come in. Oster, you've mentioned as Leuven's is he? Oh, he's, he, he he, just... he's he's not fit. I don't think. Right. I don't think uh, they like him anymore. Right. So no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it's element of that. you know, it's who do you go with? Obviously, the two lads, Baldwin and um, Flanagan, have been playing regularly. You know, over the last couple of months and so, um, yeah. So I'm guessing he might look to to freshen it and bring one of the centre halves in. Mm-hmm. But as you say, if you're adjusting both at the same time, you know, it could go one way or the other. Yeah, it? I think there are a lot of variables there. I yeah. think Baldwin alongside Dunn probably would be my choice, but that's the most sensible. It choice. brings back all of the potential risk that Jimmy Dunn carries as well because he wasn't very good. There's a reason he got dropped. You know, it's uh, but you know, it, it's. He's dropped players throughout the season, Ross, and brought them back in after a spell out and they've been better for it. I know Baldwin had a positive comeback. I know it's recently just come off the rails again, but uh, Chris Maguire before his injury, that was a comeback mm-hmm. from being dropped mm-hmm. and he was, you know, he looked superb bit between his teeth again. So hopefully <laughs> Jimmy yeah, Dunn yeah. can come in and do something for us. Yeah. The key is obviously get McGeady back out there, isn't it? He's oh, the last couple and he's oh, too yeah. good for League One, isn't he? I think, you know, yeah. What's he scored 11, 12 goals this season? And Something like that. Maybe even yeah. a few more, actually. He's been responsible yeah. for around the 20 yeah. marks. Assists and stuff as yeah. well. Yeah. And just getting him on the ball. And as you said, obviously, I watched the, the final the other week and he was the, the one spark for Sunderland who looked like he was going to make something happen, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. In the uh, first half, he can just dance through. He was just yeah. dancing through players. I yeah. mean, he's done that all season. He just he does just look too good. When we were watching him last season in the Championship, there were games when I thought he could do it in the Premier League, this yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, so that's still good. He's sharp, still sharp, and you know, defenders have got that bit of fear in, in going to to commit because he can make mm-hmm. them look silly at times. Yeah. yeah. What do you make of Emma? Have you seen much of Brian Oviedo this season, Danny? Because he's another player who obviously not too long ago was only second fiddle to Leighton Baines. Yeah. These days he's been kept up by Reese James, so you know yeah. the, the levels for him have been fairly ridiculous. Yeah. How quickly he's dropped. But I mean, you know, he 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 played where you played. Left yeah, back. I know. So. I think I haven't seen too much. I don't think he's played that much. Is it, is it a case of Sunderland trying to get him out or off the wage bill or uh, something? I I'm mean, not sure. But he, um, from what I heard, he was going to go yeah. to West Brom yeah, uh, yeah. on loan in January, but the, the deal yeah. didn't materialise. But right. he's, he's back fighting for his place yeah. now, and he's he's been nothing but, but professional. professional yeah. yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you don't know the ins and outs. You can get some lads who can be a bit of a, a pain around the training ground. You know, and we've a bit had of a bad egg. Of those. But, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but uh, by all accounts, he's saying if he's just got on with it and got his head down and. And cracked on, and obviously, you say he played yesterday. Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen, I think I might have played against him before um, when he might have been at Everton, I'm not sure, but good player, I think, you know. Again, probably one who's pro- on his days, you know, too good for, for League One. Yeah. Um, I think the other young lad who came in the other week, Denver Hume, isn't mm-hmm. it? Played against us pre season down at Grimsby. Right. Um, look, I thought he looked good that night, actually, when we played you pre season. Um, and he came on the knee in the, in the cup final the other week as well. Big time Denver Hume but, fan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I yeah. think he's he's going to be a good one for, for the future for Sunderland. Yeah, he's, he looks very tricky. I think coming down yeah. when he, he he plays very well as like a like a wing back. Yeah, you know he uh, yeah gets well, bum, gets bums off seats. Yeah, he's got that ability to use his his weak foot as well. So he can if he's going down the left hand side, he can invert his run and yeah. offer an option inside, or he can take the ball by himself all the way into the box. Yeah. So he's he's got a uh, he's got definitely something to offer. Mm. A testament though to um. Uh, perhaps how much people want a change in the midfield just like as a joke last night on Twitter I made a poll of just like which um, uh, which centre back partnership do people want to see on Friday when we play Doncaster and the options were Baldwin and Flanagan Baldwin and Dunn Baldwin and Ozturk and Ozturk and Dunn and Ozturk and Dunn got 59% of the votes <laughs> with Baldwin and Dunn which I think is for all intents and purposes the smarter option the safer one the more sensible thing to pick that got 24 so I think that maybe shows just how little faith people have in Baldwin and Flanagan. I think one of the things as well that I will mention about Doncaster is they still have 
the uh, playoffs to play for, don't they? They're still they're, they're sick for the moment. I think. Yeah, they don't sick, but yeah. they could drop out of that, could they? If... Uh, I think that there aren't any teams breathing down the necks if I remember rightly I think there's teams like Burton and Coventry Peterborough, about... Peterborough are 7th aren't they so there's yeah, a few points between they're about 6-7 points behind mm. them but I think realistically they, they, they'll they be thinking that they shouldn't be caught and I, I don't think they will be I think they, they, they'll be they'll, they'll take 6th place come the end of the season I think that'll be them in the playoffs because I just feel like there's a little bit more pressure on them than there was Burton and Coventry perhaps oh, so, yeah. and that would maybe play in our favour you know they obviously don't want to lose in case Peterborough catch them mm-hmm. With Burton and Coventry, I mean, they're mid-table and they're not going down. I don't think they've got any chance of going up. So they've got like just going out and enjoying the day. Sunderland have a lot of pressure on them to get second place still. Um, and I felt like when you watch Burton and you watch Coventry, it just they looked a lot more relaxed. Yeah, I thought they just you know it's like oh just go and enjoy yourselves. Well, Burton and Coventry were one of like the two or three teams in this league that have nothing to play for, and I think at the moment they're probably the teams that are going to punish us the most, aren't they? The teams that have no pressure on them can just play us and just relax knowing that we are, are bricking it because a, a, a points dropped against a team like that is going to really dent our chances of coming second or even first I mean I don't know if again I think we're going we're to ask you this Danny um, over the years have you ever found that maybe with like promotion pushes relegation scraps come the end of the season is it the teams that are around mid-table that can't go anywhere are they teams that are often quite tricky to, to play uh, in a way, I mean, ourselves at the minute, we're in that sim- similar position mm-hmm. with Grimsby, you know, sort of 16th, 17th, sat in mid-table. Um, I never really get there, in a way, nothing to play for. I think going out there at three o'clock on a Saturday, once you're kitted up, you're ready for the kickoff. You want to go out and you want to win a game of football. I do anyway, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but as you say, there's teams there. If they haven't got something to play for, if you like, if they not, can't go up, can't go down, they can go out there with a bit of freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, as you say, about Coventry, what, 8th or ninth, but... You know, went out there yesterday and perhaps played with that. I haven't got any pressure on them to go there. Coming up to Sunderland, mm-hmm. good crowd in. Um, pressure's all on Sunderland, really, isn't it? To yeah. go out and get the result. And, mm-hmm. you know, as you say, only getting a point from the, the last two games against Burton and Coventry, um, not ideal, um, especially with the next three fixtures coming up. Mm-hmm. What you got? Yeah, if, if you set the ambition for second place, then you can't take one from six at the mm-hmm. stage in the season. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they are decent teams, but I think that's. Um, uh, it's just, you know, it really just put me in a bad mood, that game. It's really just quite, it's 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 worrying, really, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, we're, we're, we've shown some really scary defensive frailties yeah. against what are relatively good mm-hmm. League One teams with pacey players. And we've got Doncaster with John Marquis to play. Yeah. We've got, obviously, Fleetwood, who are no mugs. They're in the same sort of board yeah. as Burton and Coventry. Portsmouth, You've yeah. got Peterborough at the same, Portsmouth, yeah. who obviously, you know, have beaten us yeah. twice this season. Yeah, now. that's the one, isn't it, as well. It's only South End that I think are a team that I feel comfortable with us beating, but mm. that's the last game of the season. Yeah, so you hopefully know. you need to get in a good position before that one, don't you? Too? Absolutely. Some exchange betting companies run short lived promotions, like months long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAC is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAC, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. I think just so I don't sort of go down this like absolute rabbit hole of negativity, let's talk about some of the positives that we can garner from yesterday's game or from this week in general. And it comes in the form of our quick question, which I asked on Twitter this morning. No. Yeah, yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, I asked on Twitter via the Roper Report Twitter um, for everyone's best and worst things about the game yesterday. Was what just anything at all about the Sunderland Coventry encounter? What what went? What was the thing that went the best? And what was the worst aspect of the game? So we'll start with Darren Barger. He says the best was Charlie Wyke. He gave one hundred percent effort and won most aerial duels. And the worst was always looking like we'll concede every time we're on the ball. Which, and I mean, fair enough, you know, worst, that's true. We did look like every time they came forward, I thought they were going to score, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But Charlie Wyke, what do we make of him, Chris? Ah, uh, really pleased for him. Um, I, I genuinely like happy for him. I know it sounds a bit paralyzing, I don't mean it that way. But obviously, he had a really, really tough first season, you know, through injury and sort of lack of confidence there for a bit. But he's come back really strong and now he looks like the target man that we really sort of need as that option, that outlet. I mean, the way he sort of, yeah, his aerial like, ability was really on show. The way he sort of battled those centre-offs were really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, he actually got a couple of free kicks for being fouled by a centre-off for the first time in what feels like the entire season. 
Um, only thing, and this isn't a comment on Charlie White, it's just I wish people would get the second ball, and it was so frustrating yesterday. I don't think we won a single second ball. And I've, I've often sort of wondered, like, how much of that result would be different if we had that hold him in field, so if Ledbetter was allowed to sit, mm -hmm. meaning Power didn't have to really worry about his position so much. So when the ball comes up to Wyke, he could push up and try and win that second ball, because that's what we were missing. You had Ledbetter and Power pretty much directly in front of the left and right centre halves. So you've then got like Charlie White winning the ball and these two sort of scared to move because they can't one of the you know they have to stay, yeah. that's their position. Yeah. So if you've got Ledbetter there of the instruction just to stop, then it means power can push up a bit higher. And when Charlie White does his job as well as he did yesterday, yeah. we'll have a lot more joy, we'll keep the ball a lot more. Mm -hmm. And a couple of their opportunities came from us not winning a second ball. I mean, I think their their, their winner came from a knockdown going to their team and then nobody pressing. And then McGeady was out of position and they just went straight past us. Yeah, well, I think, to be honest, I mean, what won them the game was uh, Baldwin being about a yard away from where he should <laughs> be when he put his leg out. I don't know. I feel like it, it looked like the kind of challenge you'd make on FIFA if you weren't really used to playing FIFA. And you'd just sort of like, you know what I mean? If you couldn't really get like your, your depth perception right of the game, but, you know. He sort of got lulled to, to sleep a bit. Like, he was sort of tracking back, like jogging backwards, and then just didn't stop. Like, nobody in the back line... Like no one with enough leadership went right. Stop, <laughs> like stop yeah. going back. Like we need to, like you know, keep the line here and defend like this because the winger wasn't going down the byline. He was just there, like occupying the space, and everyone just kept backing off. Yeah. How did you feel about Charlie White, Johnny? Played well. Uh, he's been playing well actually since the cup final. I think he's had a pretty good run of games. Mm -hmm. Does he look more like the striker that we were sort of sold when we originally bought him compared to what we saw? When he came back from injury, does he look more like the player we hoped he'd be now? Is what I'm saying. He's he's getting there, I think. Yeah, I think he's definitely getting close to being that player. Um, good in the air, as I say, he's got a few goals now, um, and he's shown he can actually finish quite well. When you saw that yeah. goal against uh, Rochdale, well, he's missed a couple of sitters. He has missed a couple of sitters <laughs> yeah. though against Burton. Now, yeah, he's I'm not going to hide from that. The, the game against Burton, we should have won two one because he should have scored that goal. It was a sitter. And I think even yourself, Danny, probably would have scored that goal if it fell to you. <laughs> it was a weird one, like, because obviously he was a sitter and he probably should have scored, but I think the keeper doesn't react to it. He just guesses and just throws himself to the left and he happens to be where White kicks it. It's sort of a, it's a weird one. I don't know whether I should be thinking, like, well, unlucky White, because... He all, all he did was get the ball and have a snapshot. Like he you had didn't a split second it. to think about that. Yeah, and the keeper yeah. was exactly the same, and he guessed right. I think. I think that's more what it was than him actually missing the sitter. Yeah, yeah. But he is I'm playing. Sure, he's I'm not playing sure, well. but yeah. But, but as I say, he, he is playing well at the moment. And uh, I mean, Greg, I don't know. He's, he's been. He hasn't been as good since the final. It's funny. Like, one he's of them's got a gammy better. ankle. He looks injured. Has he? Like, yeah, 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 he yeah, needs yeah. to sit yeah. down. He can't. Like, um, <laughs> he needs to sit down. <laughs> he just needs to stop running about on it. Yeah. I've watched Grigg in the past. Like he, when he presses people, he yeah. doesn't stop. He just continues. Yeah. Like watching him shuttle runs. Yeah. But for us, he'll sprint towards one centre off and then just go. Oh, well, that's it. Like he just he can't for a bit. summon the energy to do it again. Yeah. So Danny, yeah. I know you said earlier that obviously a lot of teams in League Two have that you know quote unquote big lump up top, yeah. and you know a big Charlie White is probably what we envisioned we'd have in mm -hmm. League One. Yeah, I mean, what I do know as well is that you haven't played in the third division of English football. You've played in the Prem, the Championship and League Two. You've not played in League One. No. But I'd imagine that there are similarities between League One and League Two. That that just seems yeah. to me like it will be the case. What makes a good lump? Um, <laughs> to put, to well, put it extremely bluntly. Yeah, it's, it's back to play. You know, balls clipped up to them. Uh, yeah. you no know, clipping diagonals. Sticking it for you know as, as a centre half, there's nothing more you love than if you've got the the big nine on your team. Yeah. Ball's going up to him. He gets hold of it for you, drops it off to the to the ten or po pops it out wide, mm -hmm. and then it just gives you that breather at the back as well, just to get up. But if you know if the ball's going up there and it's bouncing off him and it keeps coming back and that you, you know it makes our job harder at the back really. Yeah. We can't can't give us time to you know bump up five yards at the back. Mm -hmm. um, but someone like but again in our league, you know we've had uh, well this year a kin day at Lincoln. Absolute, you know, John Akinde. John Akinde, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's done well for them. You know, he's a he's a big strapping lad, and he gets hold of it for him. Um, Akinfema last year, obviously at Wickham, you know, we had him last yeah. year. You know, he, he's week in week out, you come up against like I mean, I like that side of the game. You know, balls coming up, and you're competing right. and stuff. And well, I'm extremely shocked you've mentioned him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, what a surprise! It was, I mean, obviously, James Collins at, at Luton. Obviously, mm -hmm. last year Luton came up, they won our league and came up with Akinfema. Yeah. The but, uh, season, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, he's, he, he does a bit of both, really. He's, he, he works his socks off and uh, he can get hold of it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, as, again, 
I mean, I played against Charlie White a couple of years ago. He was at Carlisle. Yeah, I was, I was about yeah, to say as well. So, yeah, yeah. Was at two, two seasons ago, I think. Got like a, first I got year. Charlie's Wikipedia up. I was going to bring that into it. Right, you got him on there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, again, I remember to say, you know, put himself about and that, and that, you know, works his works his shift up top as well, really. Yeah. Um, but I always think you need one of them in, even if, you know, you've got a gaffer who wants to play pure football, mm-hmm. you, whether you start with a, a big nine or, or you've got one off the bench to come on, you know, if things aren't going to plan with plan A, you're trying to play your football, it's not quite working out. You know, you might be one nil down, ten minutes to go. Chuck a big lad up. You know, Kev Kyle used, for instance. You know, someone like yeah. that, Quinny Kev Kyle. You know, chuck a ball up to them, get balls in and around the box, and you know it can drop down for you, as you mentioned there. Second balls, lads coming onto it really, and you know it's hard to defend against it, whatever level you're playing at. Really, you know, in the top flight, you know, uh, to say the difference it is when you're playing against the top teams, or when I've played against the your Man Cities and that in the past. You probably come off the pitch and you haven't netted more than four or five balls. Mm-hmm. It's all in and around you, your feet in the final third. Yeah, it's a lot more fluid. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. it's all that switch on sharp mm-hmm. stuff in, in yeah. the final third. You know, teams lower down maybe. Glenn Murray's, for instance, at Brighton. You know, they'll they'll have balls what they'll throw up to him and that. But as you're saying, gradually, the, the further you go down the leagues, then, you know, I've probably come off the pitch at Morecambe yesterday on a, on a windy mm-hmm. one and uh, probably added about 45 balls at, at yeah. Morecambe yesterday, you know, yeah. so... Uh, that's just that's just part of the game and how it is further down the leagues yeah well, what we're going to do as well and I suppose I'll say this for the viewers now is in the latter part of this podcast we're going to have a chat with you personally Danny about maybe the ins and outs of playing as a defender as you go down the divisions yeah. but we'll throw this one now to Chris and Johnny I think what um, I think what Danny said there about the criteria for a good target man that probably meets what we've seen from White recently, doesn't it? You know, he's what we've seen a lot of, especially yesterday. There aren't there, there are the, the, the positives of a five four loss, a few and far between. You know, you ship five goals at home; it's hardly positive in my opinion. But w- what I generally found was that if we're going to be positive about anyone, I think Charlie White would have to be my man of the match by default because the way he won the ball and the way he brought yeah. the likes of Greg and Morgan into play, I think. As Danny says again, you know the, the the extra time that he buys you just by holding the ball up to get you sort of more creative, you know, quicker players, better finishes like Grig into the mixer, it makes all the difference. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the only thing I let Wyke down was the players around him. Uh, mm-hmm. You got you playing two up top, and if Charlie Wyke wins the header, Grig needs to be running off the shoulder of that centre half as well because that's where the ball's going. You know, he's not going to head it back towards our goal. He's going to try and flick it on into the space behind. So you need to run that channel and. Nobody did. So for White, yeah, man of the match, easily for me. But I just think if you're looking at that list of things that you've described yeah. there, Danny, like what are you looking for in a target man? That was the list that yeah. the scouting department came up with or Jack Ross gave, mm-hmm. you know, Tony Conan and that to go find this man for me. And they signed yeah. Charlie White specifically for that. Mm-hmm. Took a gamble on his fitness at the start of the season. And unfortunately, he ended up getting clattered by that uh, stupid goalie. Oh, ridiculous. Burton, so. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's the, he was the right signing and he's, he's showing now and I'm really happy for him showing it because it justifies the scouting department yeah. and Ross's decision to bring him in and it justifies himself a bit as well. Like He, he yeah. says, listen, I deserve this chance. Yeah. I'm showing you that I'm worth it. Yeah. Worth it. It's just, just taking a bit in too late. Well, so game yeah. time, you can't get, you know, you can train as much as you like or play reserve team football, but you only get your full match fitness from playing first team football, mm-hmm. I feel, you yeah. know, when I've been out in the past or whatever. You know. yeah, Especially well, if your job's to bruise people yeah, yeah, when yeah. headers you need to be yeah. fully fit to do that you yeah. can't yeah. just be uh... well I think playing reserve games or maybe under 23 games etc like that's like what what you're doing there is maybe putting your game in, in theory but then it's only in practice if you're actually playing a competitive game of football yeah. I mean it's just I suppose it's one of those things isn't it I mean, it, like, I mean obviously I've never played professional football but I just sort of like it, it makes sense you yeah. know? have you not? <laughs> no Chris I haven't amazingly no <laughs> I think, yeah, I think Charlie White, one of the match for me as well. Um, Morgan, perhaps, if you want to go for anybody else. but Morgan, I, I, I agree, he was good. Like, mm-hmm. he's the goal he set up, and that was great. He, he feels like, and this is probably a side effect of being a young player, but he seems to be sort of like half a second behind at times, and it's frustrating. Mm-hmm. Like, opportunities mm-hmm. to press. Like, we need to pick and choose our moments to press because that's when you get caught on the counter. But there was a couple of times where, like, maybe the ball was cleared from a corner, and if he was just a second faster it's like a, a second more switched on like everybody else in the crowd yeah, could see it because yeah. we've got a better view of it but he maybe just stepped to the left quicker or got yeah, his foot on the ball or just, yeah, yeah just yeah. that ability to read things would really yeah. set him apart from everybody else yeah he did very well for the first goal though Morgan oh, he it was did super very very well yeah, yeah great great yeah. dribble yeah. great move I mean, attacked that full back as well which really I love is, to see yeah, like, really yeah, went it I think if the game ended uh, if the game ended at, at half an hour then he would have been man of the match comfortably but we would have lost 3-1 but yeah, but he would have been one of the match. <laughs> I mean, we lost regardless. But yeah. Would you rather have lost 3-1 or 5-4? That's a good question. Mm. 
honestly, to be fair, I'd probably rather have lost three one. I think I'd rather I think, take a punch in the face. To be fair, yeah, I mean, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna lose, then I'd want to lose by the least goals possible. Really, like I'd rather lose one nil than eight not eight seven. You know, it's just one of those things. Because like ultimately, what what that means is that you've taken no points and you've let X number of goals in. Those are the those are the brute facts of the game. So, but anyway, I think one of the things as well, like we we did come back from three one down, which never usually used to happen with Sunderland. We'll go four, then we we'll go you know yeah. four three down, then we equalise again. Um, so I guess you can look at that potentially as a positive. We kept going, um, but then this got a fifth. It just felt like it would just keep. I don't know, just deflated yeah, after that. There was but, an, yeah, it's the, it's the never say die attitude. Maybe maybe echoes M um, uh, Keane's or seven oh eight yeah. season, Danny. You yeah, know, maybe yeah. the you know not not you know kicking until the last minute. You know, getting the last minute goals. Yeah, ensuring we would get the results we need. It's all there. But as well with the quick question, um, on a very similar note to what we've just talked about, Harry Redman says that his best moment of the game was that Wyke looks like the striker we were promised, which I think we've just said there. You know, he looks like the player that's been scouted and the player that we're seeing with the yeah. attributes that were sort of highlighted by Tony Corton and co. And the worst, he says that he slumped on at the table at work when he saw that Flanagan's name was on the team sheet. Uh, I actually... <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was talking about it on the drive-in, and mm-hmm. uh, I went like, "Oh, I just hope like Flanagan doesn't start." Yeah, and then team sheets came, and I was like, "Ah, oh, no." no. <laughs> he said as well that I know he's done well at times, but surely it's time to end the Luke or nine right back experiment and bring back Matthews. How do we feel about that? Do we want Adam Matthews there's, back in the squad? There's obviously a reason no nines in the squad ahead of Matthews. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think on nines had one bad game to be honest. I, I think uh, he's, he's looked Wickham. very good. It's. it's uh... It's a weird one. It's, it, I don't think if Matthews is fully fit, um, there's obviously a reason he's not playing, mm-hmm. and so you just have to trust the the manager and the you coaching do. staff for that because he's obviously you know he's a contract coming up. He's yeah. obviously in a different he's headspace. Training so. ground, as you say, yeah. Yeah. you only see ninety minutes of what the lads do, don't you? Do you know what I mean? You're not yeah. seeing the day in day outs around the training ground and stuff, and mm-hmm. how lads are when they're out of the team and stuff. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of are they pushing themselves to get back yeah. into the starting eleven then. Oh, oh, 09 could develop into like a leader, like a captain type player. Oh, I mean, absolutely. He's got the character. You watch the way he trains. Like when you watch like the sort of yeah. everyone's lined up doing the warm ups and that at the start of the game, yeah. like the, the moving warm up, it's always uh, Honeyman and 09 who are like sort the of the SWATs that are like yeah. leading, the, <laughs> leading the everybody. Swats, yeah. the, the first person to touch the line at yeah. one side and the first person to touch it on the other uh, side. There's an element of that, definitely. I'm going to try and forge another um, uh, maybe unlikely connection as well, Danny. Yeah. I know that obviously you played against Charlie White because he was a Carl Allen League 2 while you would have been at Grimsby. Yeah. You played for Wales. Yeah. Adam Matthews as well as international. Yeah. Ever played with him at the same time? Ever trained with him at the same time? Yeah, I think he was just coming into the squads as right. I was coming towards the end of my time there, yeah. I think, really, yeah. Any sort of like notable attributes about him? Do you think? No, I think is he just you know I've seen him play obviously a few times and stuff. I think it's just a steady right back, isn't he? Yeah. Really, you know, That's what he's defensively one on one, not too bad. I'd say. Yeah. yeah, I think he's a but good league one fullback, maybe. Yeah. Below average, yeah. You know, I mean, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's just how I see it. I think interesting but, on 09 is you can definitely tell he's still learning as he plays. Like, he there's a uh, obviously the first goal, he's never going to play that pass I, ever again. I, yeah. <laughs> looking at it, I, I'm guessing. He might have had someone there and he, he hasn't seen the lad, you know, no. he's tried to wrap a ball into the middle of the park and play it yeah. straight to the lad and he nah, turned around five, five, five seconds later yeah, it's in the back of the net, you know. Very easily intercepted, but... A mm. couple of times when he was getting sort of pushed back by mm. Huli, he would just get skinned and he would go around him and he learned, you could see it in the second half, he would hit him mm. instead of sagging off and letting him beat him for pace, he would hit him early. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of times it didn't come off and he ended up getting around him, but mm. it, he's figuring it out as he goes, which obviously not what you need when you're in a no. promotion race at the end of the season, but it's what we've got and yeah. you've got to see he is at least improving at that aspect of his game mm. I mean he, he's uh, you know like sort of traditionally when he's played he's been a cam or just a regular midfielder and he's yeah. gone from that to a fullback Danny yeah, yeah. so I mean as, you, as you've said there when he's looked to pick out the man he's looked for, like the underlap basically he's looked yeah. to like sort of swing the ball in and pick out his man yeah. Is is that sort of vision required from a fullback a skill that needs to be learned that a midfielder maybe wouldn't have as well as the average good fullback would I think I think so. Yeah. Again, going back to what you've asked earlier, I think the lads in the top leagues they see them passes as opposed to what the the lads in the lower leagues don't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, at, at Grimsby we've got a lot of boys who have come from the conference and stuff, so mm-hmm. it's a it's a learning game for them, really. You know, um, they don't perhaps see passes as quick as what lads do when they've played higher up and mm-hmm. stuff. And you know, reading the game, what you mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. with the young lad Morgan, um, that'll just come with time, I mm-hmm. think. You know, but as you say, there generally, if you've got a centre midfield who's filling in at, at full back. He probably can see them passes more. Do you know what I mean? Because he's used yeah. to having that 
vision in the middle of the park. You know, you have to have the the open opening up and, and mm-hmm. picking passes out and stuff. But again, I think from seeing the highlights there, I think he's just not seen the lad. Uh, right, been blocked by one of the other Sunderland boys, and mm-hmm. as he's played it, he's, you know, he stepped across yeah. and then. One of them in it really, he's turning around and he's put it in the bottom corner. So. Uh, it's a learning curve. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. You know, yeah. reading the game as you say, it's um, uh, it's a mental trait. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's purely game intelligence. It'll, yeah. it'll have to come in time. Yeah. And I, I'd yeah. imagine with all nine, you know, he's you know he's very switched on. You know, he's he's, he's got good aptitude. I'd yeah. imagine it would come in time. I, I don't hold anything against him. I'd play him again yeah. at right back um, on on Friday, and I would keep Matthews out. I just. I think, as you say, there, Chris. There's a reason Matthews is is out and all yeah. nine's in. So, I think. Yeah. Um, I think with Jack Ross, I might have found him to be quite stubborn in some ways, like persist him at certain plays, perhaps. And I wonder, maybe, I, I'm, I don't think he will with Flanagan, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me slightly if he actually just keeps the same team as well, because they'll want to prove themselves. They'll want to prove, you know, they're not as bad as that that game suggested, maybe. And I think. In some ways, I can understand managers not tinkering with things and just keeping things the way they are. But in the same same uh, sentence, I do think that he needs to be dropped in this game, Flanagan, just for even for one game and yeah. replaced with Jimmy Dunn. Uh, one question I would like to ask you guys, though, you know, just to address some people who think maybe he should get sacked. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Do you th- can you see any sort of uh, logic. Uh, well, obviously, some fans think maybe he's bottling it for us. Do you think there's any good reason for him to get sacked at this no. stage? No? no, I wouldn't. No, absolutely not. I mean, like, even I, if we don't get promoted, I'd keep him. Yeah, I think. I think. Obviously, there are. You, you do hear the odd person maybe in the stands shouting, "Oh, we should sack him!" And uh, you know, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's a game of opinions. Football. We're all entitled to an opinion. But um, I personally, if if we were to sack him now, that would be. If we were to sack him based on not getting promoted, I think that'd be a terrible idea. I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, we, we can't we can't just sack him. If we, I mean, ultimately, if we don't get promoted, for me, it's a failure. For many fans, it's a failure. But what's important is that he gets it right and he builds and consolidates the squad. He's th- had to throw it together for next season. If, say, we get to um, December, January of next season and we're outside the top six, I'd maybe consider if he's the right man for us. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd probably be having... I'd, I'd be very worried if we weren't pushing very convincingly for promotion next season should we not go up this season but yeah to sack him now absolutely not but we'd have to monitor how he does next season for me well from my point of view looking on the outside I think it's a ridiculous shout in terms yeah. of mm-hmm. big turnover of players this year you know the board have all changed around I think some of the clouds lifted over the stadium if you like what's been there the last few years got to a cup final um, you know you're playing catch up with games in terms of that because the checker trade is dragged out with the lads a bit Still in the great position, third. You know, at least at least looking at the playoffs. You know, so it's a positive season, I think, in a in a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously the expectations of the club are, are, are massive. You know, with the fan base and everything behind the club. I just think, you know, he's he's come in. I think he's proved himself, if you like, in a way. And and you've, you've got to give him the chance. What you're going to replace him with now, with five games to go? Do you know what I mean? It's a, yeah, it's a mad decision. Yeah, I agree. And I think what we'll do there, I think we might be good to leave the discussion of the game there. I want to end, though, with one last um, response to the quick question, just because I found it funny. It, it doesn't really add anything substantive for discussion, but I just found it funny. But you have a contribution there, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Stu says that his worst thing about the game, an obvious one, was the Titanic-sized gap between the midfield and our defence, You know, which was a totally yeah. a thing that was happening. But his best was that he managed to get a parking space at 1.55pm in the town. Well done. <laughs> yeah, that, oh, it went oh. well in. I've, I've never managed to do that, so yeah, fair play, Stu. Fair play. So, as I said, uh, I alluded to this earlier, but we're going to have a little chat with you now, Danny. So, Danny Collins, you've played in three of the four Football League divisions over the course of your career. The Premier League with Sunderland, yep. the Championship, again, with Sunderland for two seasons, N- Notts Forest, Ipswich, West Ham, and Rotherham, I believe. Is that is that the lot of your... Stoke. St- I went to Stoke oh, for me. Stoke, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Stoke. Yeah. I can't believe like, Stoke. That's like the main of yeah, the team. It's that like is the main, yeah. joke, isn't it? Like Stoke right. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they're, just, they're just like, because, because about you and about like half of Roy Keane's Sutherland team went to Stoke. Yeah, that know. was like, Liam, yeah. Liam went, yeah, there's a few of us went down. Oh, I know, I can't believe I've missed that one. out. <laughs> rookie mistake, that. Uh, Dean White as well. Yeah. Dean White Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean Liam, yeah. Class. But yes, obviously there's Sutherland and Stoke, West Bram. West Bram? West Bram. West Ham. West, West Ham, that's West the one. Ham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> West, West Brom and West Ham. Right, right, so basically, I'm having a shock. You've played in the Premier League, the Champo, and League Two with Grimsby, right? Those, yes. those are the brute facts. I'll not dance around that anymore and okay. try and talk when I can't. 
So what we want to talk about now, Danny, is obviously it's especially relevant given that the main most controversial topic of this last week is defending. You know, we've yeah. spoken at length of how defensively we look very inept. So we really want to know, you know, when we've seen defenders for Sunderland, we've seen them in very different forms throughout our time following them. You know, in the last we've gone in the last four seasons from the Premier League to yeah, yeah. the third division of English football. Mm. How do you see the game change for a defender when you, as you drop down the divisions? So if you were maybe to say chronologically, what changes going from the Premier League as you work your way down? Right, how right. does your game change? How do defenders change? Yeah. Um, perhaps what I mentioned earlier in a way I think in the top flight I mean obviously I played a lot of games at centre half and for Sunderland and Stoke as well at left back um, you're coming up against wingers in terms of Theo Walcott Aaron Lennon you know quick shot wingers mm-hmm. um, it's just I'd say the difference between the top flights and the lower leagues are the pace of the game um, quick turnovers and as, as I mentioned final third is where it all sort of kicks in if you like you know mm-hmm. it's, it's um Teams in the Premier League will let you have the ball to a certain um, area of the pitch, if you like. You know, they let you build out from the back. If you watch a Premier League game, nine times out of ten, they let the opposition just knock it around the back and stuff. You watch a game in our league, it's 100 mile an hour football. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah crash, bang, wall up, get it forward, mm-hmm. and, you know, different stuff. Like that. that's, that's the main difference, I'd say. Uh, again, Championship, you've got the top half teams, I'd say. Again, look to look to play you know you look at the teams who are up there at the minute Norwich play good football uh, Leeds are up there playing good football you know Sheffield United play with a 3-5-2 they're going well so yeah. you've got teams who are, who are playing good football and stuff and then obviously again I haven't played in League 1 but League 1 I'm guessing is similar to, to what we're playing in League 2 and a lot of teams will have the big target man and they will try and play up to him and, and get balls and bits off him but yeah you will get teams that play but the main difference I'd say is Players have the technical ability in the top flight is obviously better. Fitness-wise, I don't think there'll be a lot of difference between Leagues 1 and Leagues 2 as a championship to the Prem. Mm-hmm. All fit lads, you know, this day and age, football's different to what it was 20 years ago. Um, lads tend to look after themselves better. You know, if you have all the sports science and all the you know, the nutrition's different these days to what it was years back. Um, and I, I guess it's just seeing pictures of what we've mentioned before. You know, when you're on the ball, lads higher up, they see them, you know, look at you, De Bruyne's and players like that who see them passes and that. You don't get players in. Well, they're not playing in League Two. They're playing in the Premier League for a reason. That's yeah. why you know because they can see them passes and they can get hold of the ball and, and just you know general yeah. things. Like that. I mean, I've got loads of time for Luke or nine, but I suppose what you say there is that ability to just like that, like that. That it, it, is it. Would you say it's the mental aspect of the game as a fullback that distinguishes the Premier League players from the players in the lower leagues? Is it like the the vision that like your players? For like Man City and, yeah. and Liverpool have is it like that like awareness of the game that yeah. really put, puts them where they are in that league is it like do they perhaps let you have that bit more space knowing that they can deal with you when they need to yeah. whereas yeah. in this division and in, in League 2 as you are with Grimsby yeah. it's very just sort of like balls to the wall kind of like yeah. you know right they're coming to me we're going at them we've just got to get rid of them we don't know how we're going to do it we're just going to do it almost in a way yeah I don't think there's you know, in the top flights you've got the fear if you've got a Huddersfield going to Anfield they're going to sit off and like, let Liverpool have it at the back yeah. and you know, you've got Van Dijk and whoever's playing alongside him Matip whoever they'll just let them stroke it around and that. Mm-hmm. I don't think in League 2 as such there's a fear of oh we're going to Colchester today do you know what I mean they're the top team we're going to have to sit off and let you know mm-hmm. very rarely in, in League 2 now do, we, do I receive a ball on a Saturday and I haven't got a centre forward or a, or a winger come steaming yeah, up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, that, yeah. it's, it's different in terms of that. There's a lot more pressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah down. I'd say yeah. so, yeah. yeah. They mm-hmm. don't let you have as much time as it. You know, they want to go and win it high up. But as I say, in Premier League with the top teams, tend to get that little bit more time on the ball, mm-hmm. I think, around the back, the back third. Mm-hmm. Um, and then gradually as you're going up the pitch, so, you know, middle third and, and top third is where it sort of kicks in. And mm-hmm. that's where you've got to be switched on. You know, the little balls in and around your feet, you know, Going back in the day, you know, your Tevez's and Aguero's and all them, right? In and that's that's mm-hmm. what they're looking for, you know, the little slip balls in behind and stuff. Yeah. Do you think like an energetic forward perhaps is going to have? I mean, I, I suppose I probably know the answer. Has mm-hmm. would would have more success pressing a back line in League Two than they would in the Premier League, based on the fact that there's obviously that margin for error. Is that why yeah. it exists? Is that why the pressing game exists? Because yeah. it's just a lot more likely that they're going to spill it. Yeah. Exactly that, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, if you you know got a team a front three who go pressing the team in, in League Two or back four, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, they'll probably nick it off them or they'll force them to kick it out of play. Yeah. Whereas you I say your Chelsea's, Liverpool's, Man City's, 
they, they want that in a way you know they want Huddersfield or you know a team lower down there to come and press them so they can pop through them yeah. and that's what they want that's why Jurgen Klopp's teams were always so so yeah. eye-catching and different wasn't it because yeah. they would go right at would the, go at, the top yeah, teams it was unusual that press that, yeah. yeah so here's another question and another like I think well this is quite a big hypothetical question here Danny but yeah. let's say you know you've got like a like a Dr Frankenstein kind of scenario here yeah. you've got to build the ideal third or fourth division centre back or full back you know, we'll, 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 yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll say centre back just because yeah. you know that's sort of what we're talking about today with Bolden and Flanagan. You've got to build the ideal centre back to play in the bottom in one of the bottom two divisions of yeah. English football. Yeah. What do they need to be? What do we need to see from a, a, a defender yeah. that can do a, a very good job for a team in yeah. these divisions? Um, a good size, really. You know, yeah. you, you'll come up against the you know aerial battles week in week out, so you know be able to look after yourself and compete in the air, mm -hmm. aggressive. Um, deal with the ball and, and you know see a pass and pick a pass really and, and, and reading of the game I think as the centre centre halves in the team um, you know obviously I'm 38 coming on 39 now so you know I'm not going to be doing the 100 metres in 10 seconds these days no. you know so yeah. a lot of my game is my experience is seeing balls and reading balls and you mm -hmm. know my full back's going in tight and there I'm over I'm over his channel for the ball that's getting flipped over his head into into the channel and being mm -hmm ball side if you like of the centre centre forward getting there yeah. first he might be quicker than you're in a way you know but again after you know I think I'll always say to John Terry's the one I'll go for I don't think John Terry's ever been blessed with pace but his reading of the game mm -hmm. is he, he was aggressive you know he, everything you know technically good and that which, which mm. just made him a top player in the game but he yeah. was never quick and you know there's, no there's he players, wasn't you know what I'm saying yeah so would you say that's basically it you know is that what you could because obviously we've got to I think marry up here both good sort of like attributes and abilities for a defender with the realistic expectation that this guy's playing in the third division, he's playing in League One. Yeah. So would you say that you know what you would see in the best defender is say like what I'm getting is like like a like a no nonsense kind of like mentality of right, I get the ball yeah. and then I've got to get rid, but get rid with the vision and the spatial awareness yeah. of right, you know, like I'm gonna keep away from my striker who, as you've said before, is gonna just like keep sort of like clipping me ankles all game, yeah. trying to get the ball off me. And then I'm going to obviously receive it. And then rather than try and play it out from the back, I'm going to pick a pass to one of my men up top or to just anyone yeah, sort of further up the field or just anyone who yeah. could then engineer a better attack and move than, than, than the centre-back could. Is that how you would probably see it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think what we say in the, in the footballing world is a, a kick it and edit centre-half. Yeah. You know, you tend to try and get one of those alongside a, a ball-playing centre-half if you can, mm. or someone who's technically better than the, the other lad. But, um, you know... There are players like in the top flight who are, who are more comfortable on the ball than what they, you know, what they are in terms of having yeah. um, to, you mm -hmm. know. Um, that goes throughout the leagues. I just, I just feel that the higher up they are, the lads are playing a higher because they have just got that split second of appreciating a pass, what's around them, or seeing seeing something a bit earlier mm -hmm. than what lads are in in League Two and you know in League One. When yeah. you're going in for a tackle, like maybe yeah. not in your own box, like yeah. deeper sort of like midfield or whatever, yeah. is your first instinct just win the ball? take everything with it or do you try it like I want to win the ball but also keep it and keep possession and do you more interested in where it ends up after the tackle or do you just want to get the tackle in no again depending how the ball's coming into the lad perhaps if it's a straight one you know this day and age you can't really tackle can you, you yeah. know, the, the refs are wiping it out and stuff yeah. if it's a straight ball you're coming through the back of him you're giving a free kick you're probably going on a yellow if you think it's to the side can I get there you want to again a football in terms let him know you're there early yeah. on you know let you let your striker or whoever you look let him know you're there with the mm -hmm. tackle early on but as you say, if you can get there, if you, can, you know, having that vision is that if can I just get the ball and pop it off without having to clip it into the stand? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Having, yeah. It's just having that little bit of a composure mm. and, yeah, it, and seeing seeing what's around you. It's having the intelligence to maybe just do what we'll see there, but yeah. in a way where it's actually constructive. Because you know, anyone I think really can like can just like bring a ball down yeah. and then kick it. Yeah, you know, anyone yeah. could do that. I, you know, I, I, crikey, I could do that. Yeah. But like, there's a there's a there's a, a, def, a there's a definite skill, is what I'm yeah. saying, to like to get the ball down and then yes. ping it up the field to someone. Yeah. But do it in one fluid motion, yeah, yeah. knowing where everything is all the time. Yeah. Like that's that's what you see in a good fullback at this level. Yes. Because what was that's interesting, really? Because one of the big things that Baldwin and Flanagan get criticised for yeah. is their sort of like their like sort of inclination to just like try and play out from the back. Like mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen this a lot of them where like they'll try and bring the ball down. And then they'll try and like work the way through their place. I think, sort of to foil hat on, I think it's the first time they've been asked to do that. I think it's the first time they've yeah. had an instruction from a manager that, that says, I was say, yeah, mm -hmm. let's the do this. might be asking yeah. that of them, yeah. do you know what I mean? So they might not be where they've played before. Um, Peterborough, Burnt, with Flanagan, and that. Yeah, depending who their manager are, they might want them to get it. Managers might say, listen, don't arse around with it in your own third. Yeah. Put it out if you want, or just, you know, clip it up the pitch and get squeezed up. Mm -hmm. now, Jack might be saying to them, listen, lads, we want to 
get the ball down, yeah. play, give it to Grant or give it to Katz or whoever's there, you know, and yeah. get us playing in that. They might not be as comfortable, but if that's what the gaffer's asking of mm. them, then that's what they've got yeah. to go with, you know. Yeah, that's I think that's exactly what it is, you know. Like, there's a couple of times they sort of hesitate going for yeah. a tackle because yeah, yeah. maybe they're thinking like, oh, well, I can't just tackle them because the ball might go anywhere. I need to know where it's going and they sort of take that little second, extra yeah. second to think about yeah, what's yeah, going to happen yeah. and I think that causes them a bit of trouble as well. Mm-hmm. Where did they both come in from, uh, Flanagan? Baldwin from Peterborough, Flanagan from Burton. Burton and that, yeah. yeah. He was playing so. wing back at Burton, mind Flanagan. Was it? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It's, uh... to be fair, in, in Flanagan's defence as well, again, tinfoil hat on, squarely on, um, he's not played centre back much in his career, from what I gather. He, right. he, in pre season, he played um, as a as a defensive mid. He's played right. there before. He's played at full back quite a bit right. for Burton. He, he's um, yeah, at, at centre back, I think might not be as sort of as natural to him as it perhaps is for other centre backs in this yeah. league. And I, I'm prepared to give him some leeway there. Right. I mean, obviously, when he's sort of when he's getting to the like byline and he's like. Hitting crosses into the stands, you know. He's trying I, to like do the Hollywood pass, and yeah, it sort of frustrates yeah. me sometimes to see that because, like, he's playing centre back, and he shouldn't really try to do those kind of crosses or passes when he's that's not his role. And uh, I mean, it's not having a lot of success for it either. So especially when somebody like Grant Ledbet is standing there, yeah, yeah. in a pocket of space yeah. asking mm-hmm. for the ball. Yeah, yeah no, I, think, uh, I think obviously playing with Grant and that. Earlier on in my time with him, Grant was going to play the Ipswich with Grant as well. All right. Grant could get forward, he could get you a goal, couldn't he? But I think at the age of Grant's at now as well, and I think he's suited to yeah. just being that one sitting mm. in front. But then you've got Katz who's similar to that role as well, isn't he? Yeah. Max Powers along those lines, which yeah. is not really a yeah. box. Yeah. Mind you, Lee Catamull's apparently a goal machine. He's, got a few this like he's yeah, been yeah, banging yeah, him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a bit more of a Lampard now yeah. than he is. He's <laughs> <laughs> a Lampard he's ever been. Oh, God, the Lampard of League One, Lee Catamull, Lee Barry, the yeah. boy. Uh, but to be fair with with Grant as well, he's looked. Um, he hasn't scored yet, but he's, yeah. he's come very close on a fair few times now. Like he, he loves a nice shot from outside the box. Yeah. He, he um, uh, hit one off the post um, against Burton. Oh. Could have easily been right, the winner. Yeah, I think so. I made, made one of the most close. bizarre noises I've ever heard in a football match. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like what on earth just happened there? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you leaned away from the mic when you did that. Yeah, that could have been. Could have that been was very, for Sean. Yeah, Danny, I was just wondering. Um, yep. Obviously, when you you're at Sunderland, you're Roy Keane was manager and then you went yep. along to Stoke and Tony Pulis is the manager there. Um, yep. How different is your role um, at the uh, being managed by the by them two managers? Is your role as a centre-back, does it change slightly based on how he wants, how they want to play? Or? Yeah, yeah. well, my role changed at, at Stoke because I, I think I only played two games out of my games at Stoke at centre oh, nice. Funny enough, yeah, I was at left-back. Um, mm. I think Shawcross and Robert Hoof were the two centre-halves there. Yeah. So yeah, mm. I found a lot of my games at left-back. But yeah, in terms of the way, again, going back to how managers like to play, Tony was, you know, as it says on the team, really, basically 4 4 2. Yeah. Um, I had Matty Etherington playing in front of me. He just wanted me to either give the ball to Matty or drop a diag into uh, Kenwin, another one who came down there. Yeah. <laughs> Kenwin can't, or can't Crouchy, believe really, Kenwin, you know. Yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's quite basic football in a way, if you want, but it worked, you know. The, you know, as you see, the teams used to come down to the Britain, yeah. didn't enjoy coming down there. Um, you know, big physical team we were and, and got a, got a, in and amongst teams and made it difficult. But yeah, when Roy came in, um, he brought a lot of players in, came in quick, didn't they? You know, a lot mm-hmm. of the the Irish boys came in. Yeah. And, uh, obviously, Johnny Evans came in, Danny Simpson. So we brought a lot of boys in who we knew, and uh, it's, it clicked for us in a way. Sometimes it can go either way. And uh, for us, I think we were like twenty games unbeaten. We went on a great run, yeah. and uh, and we kicked on again. Roy wanted us to try and play football as well mm-hmm. um, with Tony's assistant who. Took most of the training really, but um, sessions out on the training pitch were enjoyable and and uh, yeah, just picked the place up and we, we went on a great run, didn't we? Aye, absolutely. I think one thing Sorry as well. To interrupt, oh. but you were in the Stoke team when uh, Ramsey had that awful injury. I played that game, yeah. yeah. Ten yards away, yeah. Accidental. Um, Ryan had the ball for us. Um, went to knocked it out of his feet. I think he was looking to clip a ball and, and Aaron's ran on his sort of blind side and put his foot there as Ryan's gone to strike the ball and he's obviously caught him sort of Poo. shit no, it wasn't a great sight he's sort of from his shims at a right angle to his to oh, his foot and that. Um, yeah but you know Ryan's I know he's been booed since and that but I know Ryan well and he ain't got a bad bone in his body he's no. a big, big soft centre half if you like yeah. in a way really and Total it's accident. just one of those that, yeah it was an accident you know and uh, Felt sorry for Ryan. I think he had a cut. That was his call up for England that night as well. His first call up, and uh, bloody rough. He got that. sent off for it as well. Mm-hmm. But it's part of football, you know. It happens, and uh, thankfully, I say Aaron's come back and he's, he's playing well for Arsenal. Yeah. One thing as well. Obviously, you played um, at Sunderland 
in the or four or five in the oh well, no, was it the or three or four in the or five or six season? I would have been 04, 05. I came up in 04, yeah. 04, yeah. yeah. So 04, 05, yeah. So you played with Sunderland um, in the championship yeah. back when the, I mean, that, that, I think that was the championship's inception that season. I think that was the first season when they called it the championship. Right. Was I the, can't remember if it was, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think that's when it was. I mean, it was it was just English Division 1, I think, before that. Right. I don't really remember. I don't know. I'll have, yeah. to, I'll have to check my copy of FIFA 04. But yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a game. Excellent game. <laughs> Great soundtrack. But anyway, I, I could. Look. I could, I could go down a right rabbit hole there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so, yeah, and you played for something in the championship back when the championship was like a very sort of like new thing. The championship these days is obviously a lot different. Have you seen any like significant changes in it compared to when you played there? Um, good question there. Not, not really. I mean, there's a lot of teams who have who are in the championship now who have obviously played in the, you know, probably 90% of the teams that are in the Championship have played in the Premier League. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Villa, Leeds, things like that. Yeah, you know, some big teams in there, all of Forest, and, you yeah. know, looking to get themselves back up into mm-hmm. the Premier League. A lot of the fans feel that they should be in the Premier League. No team's got a divine right to be in the Premier League, you yeah. know. As we found out, it's a graph to get back up there. We've, Absolutely. we've done it twice in my time here, and it was tough work, you know. I think mm-hmm. we had uh, maybe Burnley, uh, Red, and I think there was a couple of good teams in around us pushing to, yeah. to go up Leicester and that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tough old league to get out of, and mm-hmm. um, you know, frankly, so we've done it a couple of times, and we had that relegation wedged in between it. Yeah, I'm just looking at the squad from uh, the 05 promotion, the McCarthy one. Yeah, Gary Breen captain. Gary Breen, season. yeah, Gary Breen's captain. Yeah, God, I, I remember I was there at the Stoke game. I think we won one nil. Yeah, I can't remember who scored. I want to say Arkep, I'm not sure. Right. And then uh, lifted the trophy, and that was just one of the most like amazing like memories. Ever. Yeah. Like, what was that squad like? As a, I know obviously past promotion teams have always been like great yeah. stories, but what was that one like? Obviously, your first season. It was, yeah. No, it was a good experience to come in. Obviously, I I was at Chester at the time. Um, played a few games in League Two. We we just won the conference, gone up into League Two with Chester. I think it was 10, 12 games, and the window wasn't in play then. I signed up here in October, I think. Come into, I think, you know, it was a. Big, big occasion for me in a way because I've come to a club with a massive stadium, you know, training grounds, unbelievable. Having come from Chester where we got four or five thousand mm-hmm. watching us week in, week out, and uh, just the experience of it all. And Sunderland sat fourth in the in championship at the time. I think the back four was George McCartney, uh, Breeny, yeah. Stevie yeah. Caldwell, and and uh, Stephen Wright was the, the back four. Mm-hmm. You know, playing week in, week out. So it was tough to to get into the team with, with a team that were doing well. Um, got me a chance I think I played 11-12 games in, in the season we went up and I think Neil Collins came in as well so you know it was a couple of young lads in and around the squad in the same boat again I think um, Dean White had just come in from Oxford yeah. um, mm-hmm. Liam had come in from Mansfield so there's some lads who've been in the lower leagues and got a chance to, to come in you know thankfully Mick used to look around the lower leagues for boys you know to come in and you know thankful got me a chance to come up here and play and uh, loved every minute of it yeah. What was McCarthy like as a manager or as a Great man? Mick yeah no I've had <laughs> You know, 20, 25 managers in my time and I'd still put Mick and me and me top two, three managers I've had. Um, Mick is what you see with Mick in, in interviews and stuff. He, he says it as it is, you know, he lets you know what he wants. Um, he's honest with boys, you know, if he's looking at dropping them, he'll pull them in on the Friday and stuff and have a word in his office. You get some managers who don't do that and as a player, you find that frustrating, you know. Yeah. You get some managers who put the team up at quarter past one on a Saturday afternoon where you perhaps think you might have been playing then you're disappointed you're not playing, you know, you think, you know mm-hmm. I'm on the bench now, whereas you know on a Thursday or a Friday you're not playing, at least you've got your, your head around it then come yeah. Saturday afternoon, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, so you just want that bit of honesty from a manager and, and Mick uh, certainly gave you that. I remember somebody asked him uh, when Sunderland eventually picked up a win in that terrible relegation season, yeah. the reporter asked him, uh, what does it feel like to get that monkey off your back? He went, monkey off my back, I've had the planet of the buddy apes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, wonderful yeah. quote from yeah, Mick McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Of course, I remember... Um, when at my first season, full season as a Southern season ticket holder was when I just got promoted under Roy Keane. I remember in that season, um, you actually scored a goal against Villa up yeah. here that was disallowed. I did, yeah. And then the season <laughs> after, you scored against Villa, and yeah. this time it was given. It was the exact same it was, goal. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, what's it like as a centre back? You obviously won't have many chances to go forward, but yeah. to score a goal, Stadium of Light. Yeah. I mean, obviously, sadly we didn't win that game, but. For you to score though, that must have yeah. felt brilliant. Yeah, well, the first one was a, a big. It was one all at the time, wasn't it? Yes, it was like ninety second yeah. minute. I, yeah. I still remember it now. I think the corners came in, got above Scott Carson, edited it, bottom corner, ran off celebrating, and then uh, the refs disallowed it. Said I've climbed on the keeper, which mm. I find that hard. But 
you know, a keeper can come out and punch it and you can yeah. do something off. I don't know. It was just bizarre, but... Uh, I think you'd struggle to climb most keepers anyway, wouldn't it's you? It's like, strange one, isn't it? Scott yeah. Carson. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, they're uh, a ladder, aren't they? They're a human, yeah. so it's like... <laughs> but no, as you say, I mean, obviously I got the one against Villa again, back at the start. I was really goal at four Sunderland at the stadium of light. Mm-hmm. Um, great feeling, you know, but it was 1-0 up and uh, as you said, I, don't, I think we lost 2-1 on the, mm-hmm. on the day. I think I might have come off a concussion. I think I clashed heads with Rio Coca. I'm not sure. But, yeah. oh, so uh, last my past that name. Yeah. We don't want to clash heads with Nigel Rio Coca. Did, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Villa. I got one at Villa for Sunderland as well. I think scored against Villa and Fulham yeah. was the other team. I think I might have got off on the <laughs> Yeah, it was going to say the Fulham game. Did you score a goal that was disallowed and then score another one? I that did, was yeah, yeah, yeah. Was yeah. that yeah. one beat the 3-1? Passage, yeah. I think we, yeah. Did you say we won? 3-1. Yeah, I think we won 3 Like Keane, Premier League. Yeah, it was, yeah. 3-1, yeah. Which was that? Which one was that? Like was that, that the one after the derby? That was the like the one like after we'd finally won an away game against Villa. Oh yeah, Do you remember that right, because like we'd gone all the one season I was thinking of was the one where won. Richardson took a free kick and hit both posts and it went out. It was no, my one. That was wonderful though <laughs> for, for many awful reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I just wanted to mention that like, obviously you scored a goal I thought it was like you know yeah no as you say for a defender well not to get too many I think I only got four in my time up here <laughs> yeah. but that um, no, was great feeling you know mm-hmm. full house at the stadium and hairs up on your neck and, yeah. and all that business yeah. it was great well, we've not really asked you know Danny like speaking of obviously just like your career I suppose like how's, how's it going to Grimsby this season this season yeah up and down season strange season you know month where we've gone without a win then we've sort of won four out of five and then again we've we've had a dip now um, sat mid-table and four games to go and uh, can't go up can't go down but um, yeah overall disappointing we did get in a position the other week where we were six points off the off the playoffs with you know 11 games to go and we were you know we were having in the meeting room and you're looking at it and games where we're feeling mm-hmm. we can get can we you know have a little push on now but we had a few injuries well mm-hmm. a lot of injuries we've got 13 fit regular first team is at the minute so we've Jeez. got a few of the young lads sort of filling the bench for us mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's, it's how the season's gone obviously Elliot was down at our place from from Sunderland and uh, he's he's had a good spell for us and he's, yeah. he's come back now I think he's done his hamstring so he's he's an, another one who's picked up an injury and, and left us um, but yeah you know four games to go we're still we're still uh, just ticking the games off now and, and see the season out hopefully on a, on a bit of a high mm. So how how would you say he's looked on the whole Elliot Embledon I mean obviously you seem to be um, you seem to rate him just from what, what you said yeah. there. But. No, he's um, he's done well. He's you know a young lad. I thought it's, it's done good for him. You know, mm-hmm. coming away from Sunderland to get first team games. At, you know, playing with men if you like in it in yeah. a proper league, and it's a good experience for him. I think he's enjoyed it. You know, I speak to him a lot and um, stayed in the hotel where I stay down there. and We've had a good chat and there. Uh, unfortunately for him, as I say, you know, he's picked up the injury with his hamstring. I think he was away with England on the twenties, and he right. when he picked it up. Um, you know, he scored a few good goals for. He got a good one against MK Dons mm-hmm. in the FA Cup yeah, for us. Uh, Benton in the top corner. Um, he's got two good feet. Um, technically very good. And uh, he takes corners with both going, feet. I think. Yeah, you know, I, I, think I said to him, which, which is your strongest foot, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so if, you know, he is, he's <laughs> comfortable with both feet, and uh, I think you know, looking for him for him in the future, I think. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a four-two-three-one for Sunderland, yeah. which would suit him, he's playing that one just in behind the striker. He can mm-hmm. get him on the ball, and he causes problems. And yeah. he's a sort of a wide right midfielder for England as well. Yeah, which is a, an interesting one because he's never really done that. No, I think yeah, I think if you ask him, he's he's more comfortable in the pocket, just playing off a off a target man. You know, he can get him on the ball, get him then little pockets, and he's he's good in and around the box. You know, as a centre half, what we mentioned earlier, you're getting dragged out, and one v ones, he's good. He can go yeah. both way, and you know, he's got a little trick in him. And, Mm-hmm. it's got that um, shooting ability that means you have yeah. to come out and respect yeah, him a no, bit more good, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah I think he's got a bright future ahead of him mm-hmm. yeah. do you think he can make it at Sunderland? I think he can yeah as yeah. I say you know he, he, what is he 19, 20 now I think he's, he's got 19 isn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah I think he might be yeah. 20 now yeah. Yeah. might have just turned 20 yeah, yeah. yeah. long, long uh, future ahead of him and uh, I think he'll do well yeah oh, well I think, I think I speak for the rest of us when I say we hope he does as well you know it's, yeah, it's yeah. always great seeing yeah. young lads coming through but it's been a big feature this season but yeah if we don't get promoted this season I think he's it's going to be knocking oh, on the, the he's, door he's got to be, yeah. next but, season yeah. him, Denver Hume Luke Molyneux uh, Kim Bjorka yeah. you know there's a, there's a lot of like promising youth players yeah. so that might that, that, that might be that might, that might be a, a maybe a consolation prize of being in League One that you've mm-hmm. got a, 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 it's, it's, there's a lot more of a viable chance of seeing your young lads yeah. get a game it's against wonders poor budget, opposition so. ah, well exactly well uh, if that's all the questions I think are we, are we good? Sure. Do we think yeah. on, the, on the question front? Yeah, okay. Well, no thank you very much, Danny, for okay. coming in today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I hope all goes well with Grimsby for the remainder of the season. And uh, yeah, do, do you think it's all going to go well at Sunderland? How, how do you think we're going to end the season? If you yeah. had to just make a prediction. Um, I'm going to say 
promotion through the playoffs. Oh, don't yeah. say that. It's not, it's not, back to Wembley, yeah. It's not how I wanted to go, but I think I mean if, if, we, if we're thinking about the documentary here, I'd imagine it looked best on Netflix to win at Wembley. I almost you know? do not want to go back to Wembley. I don't. Like, I don't. It was go great, back. honestly. Yeah. Once I don't want to go back. opportunity, but it no. was awful. <laughs> I, I, I one second, but it's looking less and less likely. Yeah. With... We've got um, oh, Jordan Cooks at our place as well, isn't he? he used to be up here. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he, he picked up an injury. I think he's done his groin, and he went down to the final. With did he? Tonight, yeah, right, so got a few Snapchats off him round there. Ball about Trafalgar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was unreal. Something else, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it was someone else. Uh, apparently, Kieran Richardson was there. Oh, was he? I've, yeah, okay. I'd heard that. It could be a rumor, but I mean, there's a there's a fair few Sunderland yeah. alumni. Obviously, you know, I think we had Jordan Henderson there for the Capital One Cup. Then I feel I've made the one for the Sugar Tree Trophy. Yeah, he was playing that day. Yeah. Oh, of course, so, yeah. shocking that. No excuse. Yeah. No, Pickford came to Sunderland, but a, we'll not talk about it. A, a, a true a true Macam would uh, forego his um, game for Liverpool just to watch the lads in the Sugar Tree Trophy. That's yeah. that's what it, that's what it <laughs> means to be a Sunderland fan. He'd get crucified on Merseyside <laughs> if he was caught at Wembley. Bloody hell, yeah, for the for the Sugar Tree Trophy. Well, <laughs> no. anyway, yeah. Well, thank you as well, Johnny and Chris, for no problem being back here. It's oh, always good. Anytime. It's always a pleasure, Johnny. Chris, it was was all right today. Uh, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We need someone for the for that joke for the out row. I was it was, it was always me when it was Connor, so I'm choosing you. Johnny's it's too fine. nice, can't have him. Can't Wait, you. Johnny's here more often. Yeah, yeah that, that's true. That's true. He's the only one who knows how to press record. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's not even that's not even remotely wrong. But yeah, anyway, that's a whole different kettle of fish. That we're not going to get into. So we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much and good night. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.